Do you live in one of the most stressed out states? This is the focus group. <laughs> it's the savvy side of nine to five. Listen. Bueller. 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 Laugh. <laughs> And learn. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. This is The Focus Group with Tim Bennett. S-T-A-U-N-C-H. And John Nash. Keep your clothes looking neat and clean. We're all business. Except when we're not. I like it. Welcome to The Focus Group. John Nash here with my good friend and co-host, Tim Bennett. And what I meant to say at the beginning was, do you live in one of the most stressed out states in the U.S.? Kind of a tongue twister. Yeah, it was like, she sells... She, she sells by the, <laughs> by the seashore. Peter Piper picked a, a pack of pickles, right? Remember there what it go. was when we were in high school? We had the we, Polish exchange students, the tongue twister? I still remember that. Which was? Which means what? Beetle on a reed. <laughs> Because we were trying to teach them tongue twisters, and then yeah. they taught us. Do you remember? You don't remember. No, I, don't. I don't know why that stayed in my, stayed with me. It's, it's fine the know. knowledge we hold on to. Hey, Focus Radio. Doc, uh, Focus Group Radio. Dot com is where you want to go to check out all things Focus Group, including the audio and video platforms we're on, and our Facebook, Instagram, and uh, LinkedIn. Everything is Focus Group Radio at Focus Group Radio. Twitter included. So we're off to a new week. Uh, you you have you have you're you're you want to say something? No, I don't want to say anything. I, I well, I have my I have my um in honor to, in honor of of my college Marietta, which I didn't get to go to homecoming last week, and I apparently missed quite a quite a party. The football team, which I was there for four years, never won a game. But they won. <laughs> they have the best record since 1920. They have they're six and zero, which is unbelievable. So, um, so I. The reason I have this on, though, is because I had three other outfits on, and it was one of those days where I guess the universe was telling me not to leave the house, but I did. So I put on a black pullover, I thought, with a with a, another shirt. I went and brushed my teeth, got toothpaste all down, <laughs> which you know you can't get out. Yeah, it's white. So I yeah. took white toothpaste. So then I take that off. Then I go in and get a plaid shirt. I thought John's been wearing plaid. Plaid looks good on, on the TV. So I go and I put... Take the plaid shirt out of the dry cleaner bag, two buttons off the <laughs> middle of it. So I was like, well, okay. So then I went and I thought, you know what, I'm going to wear, I'll wear this with another shirt and I'll put on my black, black jeans and I'll wear my big boy boots now that it's fall, those red wing boots. Put my foot right through the heel of the, of the, uh, of the sock or whatever. So I just saw so I'm in these vans. I'm kind of in this hot platypus of an outfit today. You do know that all the problems are over now, though. Things come in threes. Is that what it is? Problems come in threes. So and you're in your Peter Millar. Yeah, later on blazer. we're going to be welcoming them to the show. Um, they sent to me and Tim these blazers, and I've been loving mine since I got it. It's made by Peter Millar, and... Um, it has all sorts of cool pockets. I put my phone here. I could put my wallet there. <laughs> Why have my Mack Weldon and underwear on? So it's giving me a little. The thing about blazers in Manhattan is this is the perfect time of year when you don't want to wear a light jacket, but it's just enough that this is perfectly you know comfortable. It's got lots of pockets. It's not like the summer when you have nowhere to put things. Now I can put things everywhere. So. And as I, as I mentioned, I have my Mack Weldon undies on today, which I, I do like them a you lot. Like you them, you yeah. would turn me on to those. And they're, they're a partner with us here as well. So follow us on, or if you look on our Facebook page, there's a special code for Focus Group uh, radio listeners. So uh, we'll make sure that we uh, post that. So for your first order. Now joining us in the booth, we have the fantastic Garrett on audio and John on video. Hey, guys, we got surprises for later in the hour. How you guys doing? Where are you at? Excited now. <laughs> yeah, real good. <laughs> and this time we have milk too, Garrett. We're gonna do it right. Did you stop and get milk? I got milk. Did you get whole milk? I got milk. whole I milk. The skin you. thing. I got whole milk because I knew I would be like you know pilloried if I got anything but that. Well, why would you get anything other than that? You can't have skim milk with Oreos. Y you can. It's like a I'm, I'm, I'm not. That, the rules of the really player, can. Garrett says. She, I don't you, drink milk anyway. Do you drink milk? No, not anymore. No. But when you did, did you drink regular? When we were kids, it was whole milk. There, well, there was no such drink. thing as you had whole milk, right? Well, that's, you know. All right, so this past weekend, we had our my friend Alex and his partner Tyler visit. It was a fun weekend. Um, we went up to Williams College and went to the Clark Institute to see an art museum. Did some hiking, had fun, leaves are changing. But the interesting thing was uh, Tyler is studying for the GMAT. Is it the GMAT? Yeah. So one morning he's sitting there with his iPad and he's doing, I guess the economist had some freebie you could download to walk you through the questions and teach you how to take them apart. And I said, let me help. 
<laughs> this you is... can't do this. So the question was, Jack is able to carry four pails of water down the hill. Jill can carry three. Their friend Kevin comes along, and he could take four more times as many as something. It, it, that was the question. And then there were four answers, like, how do you figure out how many pails Kevin, I think that was the other, can carry. And I just stared at it. And even if I had guessed it, which was what the advice we got for the SATs, I would never have guessed it right. And so there's this, he, he showed me how you have to like take the problem apart. And I thought, what does this do anybody any good? I don't care how many pails of water, any of them carrying. If, if 10 had to get down the hill, then as long as the end of the day came, if 10 got down, I'm happy, right? It's like taking groceries out of the car. You might trip. You might stub your foot. Neighbor interrupts you. I, I, yeah, I went to that GMAT class. You know that. Yeah. It w was a disaster because all I did is fight every question. All the little young kids that were taking it thinking they were going to be the next captain of industry, you know, that one fact, and mine was one factory makes six shirts, one makes three shirts. You know, how do you figure it? I said, factory's out of business. <laughs> I said, no factory's making three you, shirts. You can't do that. You can't take it too literally. No. And our train leaves the station. I said, have you ever ridden Amtrak? I, I don't think it's ever gotten on time. So <laughs> yeah, why? that was one of my Where's favorite the train going to meet? Well, it depends. Did the bridge open? Did somebody else break down in front? Sally leaves Chicago at 9 a.m. on the Silver Meteor. Right. Joe leaves New York at 10.50 on whatever. When do the trains pass? Well, I love that you mentioned the Silver Meteor because today at Amtrak, <laughs> it's two and a half hours late today. And that's normal. <laughs> That gets so the, up. the answer you would have given is, will the trains ever pass at all? Or, or who cares? <laughs> Why do I need to know when they pass? I'm not getting out to get on the other one. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on this GMAT business. But a lot of schools now, particularly with SATs, it's been in the news that they're not requiring them anymore. It used to be a good, it used to be a, a, I guess, an easy cutoff for somebody. So if you were one of the Ivy League colleges and you were inundated with, with applications, you could say, you know what, anyone who didn't get a... 1300 or 1400 whatever the number was we're not even going to consider which i think you lose end up losing a lot of really creative and talented people the question that i had and i had for because tyler wants to go for an mba and he's looking at some fine schools and he's at the right age for it i mean by the time you and i even that thought crossed our mind i think we were so far down the train track that it would not have made sense economically or even from a time point of view or from a career point of view frankly but someone told you at uh wharton that you already had life experience yeah, i went and interviewed at, at uh, uh, one of the guys at, at UPenn that I knew, and for me to do this executive MBA, I think it was two hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollars, and that yeah. was eight years ago. It was before we started on Sirius, and he just looked at me and he said, "With all the experience you've had and what you've done," he said, "If you, have you done the calculation of how you will make up that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for lost wages of the two years you're going to be out of work, plus having to pay this off, plus interest, plus plus?" He said, "At the end of the day, I'm not sure." It's worth it. He goes, now, I don't want to talk you out of if you if you really feel you want to get the education and, and uh, yeah. expand yeah. your knowledge. He said, but if you're just doing it because you think you're going to all of a sudden get a half a million dollar job, it's not going to happen. Well, these guys, they, they had it logically thought through. But, yeah, there's this equation of the cost of the degree. You have to amortize that out over eight to ten years to pay it off. But all the schools will tell you, don't worry about that. You're going to earn so much money that paying off the degree is not going to make a difference. Well, the big struggle all schools are having now is... Aren't there declining numbers? Well, it or? used to be... What did we always say? The car was your second biggest purchase after a house. It's now a kid's education. Yeah, yeah. And schools now, our parents want to, people our age that have kids that are going off to college, want some sort of guarantee. Will my kid get a job or guarantee is that. their degree going? What did you say? Can't guarantee that. And that's exactly what, what the admissions person said is, I can't guarantee your kid's going to get a job. No. We can give them all the tools to hopefully help them get there, but I can't guarantee that they're going to get a job at a top blank firm. And uh, he said it's a real problem because undergraduate, well, you've got friends doing it. It's, it could be between travel and everything else, it could be sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year. Every time I hear a story from someone, we had an electrician come to the house to do a repair. A super cool and the guy has a daughter who's in school. And the daughter came home one day and said, you know, I think I want to hold off on the big ticket school until junior year. And so she happily enrolled in the community college upstate, which is actually finally accredited. She's gonna, and she's happy as all get out because she's spending a fraction of what she'll spend, right? And then she'll transfer her credits. She's already looked into the schools. They all take all the credits. And she'll do junior, senior, right? Like, is it didn't Mika do that, Mika Brzezinski? Well, she did two years or a year at Georgetown. 
And then she went to Williams. Then she went to Williams, okay. Yeah. Which you Williams? think she would have got in. Her father was a uh, Secretary of State. Do you think that would It's a big new. It's a big new. It's a big new Brzezinski. I remember his name. How could she you always forget prided his name? herself of having the worst SATs at Williams. I mean, really? that was her claim to fame was she had the worst SATs, which you and I both bombed. Not bombed. We did well on one, not on the other. Bombed, the math. Bombed is, I think I had one of the highest scores of that year in English for the, the high school. And I'd, I think you get 200 points for signing your name. name. I might have had 300 yeah. <laughs> on the math, yeah, which the is math just, oh, my God. Disaster. But, you know. So it's a guestless show today. Which I love. You know, I love a guestless show. Guests are okay. But, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I listen to talk radio. And I also still listen to some shows on Sirius XM. And when some of the hosts bring in somebody that I might not be interested in, I usually... <laughs> yeah, you switch. Not that it's not a good interview, not that it probably won't be a good show, but I, I just end up end up clicking it off. So. so what do we have on tap today? So we're going to do our usual, and then we've got... Uh, so we have two shop talks. And, uh, I see I made a mistake on one of them. Did you? Yeah, it's the second one. I, I left last week's text in. Uh, it's it's Sui Sui Genie is still in there. <laughs> well, I know you do that often. I don't bring it up. But um, I don't sometimes do it I, that often. Don't, sometimes don't I go in and correct like it. That. Sometimes I go in and correct it. But uh, And then we're going to taste some new Oreo flavors. I was in the store, and I asked you if we had tried these. I thought we did. So uh, they're not, fall. Not, they're, not one of them is a fall flavor, and one of them is one. I think we did, but I don't remember the other one. Yeah, I don't either. So, we'll, so toward the end, end of the show, we'll be we'll be sampling those. So that's right. that's that's what's exciting. So, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, mine. Is, I love yours. By well. The way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to start looking at the I, pictures. Well, I, I just, I don't, I don't quite. So the first one was, I'll just say the headline, and, and I'll go out on a limb here and say that these people probably didn't vote for Hillary. <laughs> I'll just go out on a limb. This says, Tennessee man loses leg after attacking son with chainsaw. Wait, 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 wait. Tennessee man loses, loses his leg, leg after, after attacking, attacking son with chainsaw. Okay. So there's Doug Ferguson there, if you're watching on the, on the video. He's there on the left. That's his mug shot. He ended up getting arrested, attacked his son who was mowing the lawn with a chainsaw. They got in a fight. Now, apparently, the fight was over sausages, although the police can't confirm this. Sausage? Yeah, this is Bristol, Tennessee. Or it could have been barbecue. Who knows? But they got in a fight. So Doug Ferguson, 76, uh, is charged with attempted second-degree murder after the fight with his son involved a chainsaw and lawnmower, lawnmower, which ended up in the old man getting his leg amputated. So he chased the son. So the old, the guy that instigated was the father, the old guy. That's Doug, right? He 76. ends up losing to the chainsaw. He took a chainsaw, was going after his son with the chainsaw. Now, he, uh, you didn't make this up. This, right, is, not, this, right is, not, this is like I, a bad Hollywood movie plot. I well, check, maybe not because so bad, I got but. caught once with one of these Onion stories, this story is pretty well. <laughs> you can Google this story. It's everywhere. And it, you think it's real? Yeah, it's definitely real. So uh, it, it was. It's been on the NBC affiliates. They've shown it on the on the news programs. It's been in the news. So the sheriff says that he was running after his son, trying to attack him with a chainsaw. And the son decided to defend himself and ran over Ferguson with the the riding mower. Ran over his leg. Oh, okay. So it wasn't the chainsaw that eliminated no. the leg. It was the injury from the lawnmower. So of course, Got mother it. mother called the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office arrives. They, uh, it was unclear which leg was amputated, by the way. But the sheriff's, <laughs> the sheriff's, sheriff's office arrives, and they found uh, old man Fergie laying there, bleeding pretty bad. And uh, so then they, but the son said, I was defending myself. So Ferguson was also served with a violation of probation and warrant. And uh, aside from the aggravated assault, he remains in jail. The old man that got his leg amputated. So he remains was on, in jail on a twenty-five thousand dollar bond. The old guy also had was on probation. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. And they had to delay arrest because of the severity of his injuries. <laughs> but they amputated a leg. Yeah. So he lost. I don't know which one. So he well, went actually, after his son. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter when you think about it, right? Went right after or his left, son with a right? chainsaw, and that was that. So I, that's why I said I'd go out on a limb. Not that I want a profile, but my guess is they probably did not vote for Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
<laughs> I, uh, and the other one yeah, was, yeah. was I, I knew you would like this one because this you, is one you I Bob love. had a this kick out of this before. So a few weeks back, we did a story about a fishmonger in China yes. that was selling old fish, and they put googly eyes on the fish to make them look fresh. Alive. And then the people Alive. would get home and found out that the googly eyes were just that, and Wash the fish off. really was not very good. So this is in Savannah, Georgia. And uh, the headline was, Savannah police are looking for the person who put googly eyes on the statue, and it's no laughing matter. <laughs> so the government of Savannah, Georgia, wants everyone to know that the personal preferences, that personal preferences aside, googly eyes do not belong on statues. They went to social media on Facebook, and they're trying to track down who did this. <laughs> I love this, by the way. We looked at the pictures. I called Bob into my office. I called to open the deck up. So... Tim prepares this PowerPoint file, we, we, the, their graphics deck. Sometimes he puts his stuff in before me, and this is the case where he did this. And so we could not stop laughing, well, so especially especially since some of them look like they ha they should have googly eyes, right? right? Well, so so what has happened? This has caught on. So this uh, <laughs> this from Savannah, Georgia. It started with when you look at the first picture. It started with Nathaniel Green, which was a Revolutionary War hero. And uh, from the city, so they said, even though it's funny, it's trespassing. And even though it doesn't harm the monuments, it's not something we, we want done in the city because it can get out of hand. So they went to fit. That's the one that started it. So <laughs> then the best, right? they went to Facebook again and said, well, we know it's, it, it's, uh, it looks funny. You are harming our historic monuments and public property. This is not a laughing matter. If anyone has information, please alert the Savannah Police Department. Someone should call the tip line and just laugh. So what ended up happening was, they of call course, the tip line? people started saying, going on back on Facebook, saying, you really want to waste taxpayers' money by finding out who stuck googly eyes on a statue? <laughs> And uh, that's another one of my favorites, by the way. Good find on that William Shakespeare. That's Shakespeare, right? It's, these people said it didn't do any damage, and and even though it didn't do any damage, we don't want it to get out of hand. So the other cities now, and that's what I these other three slides were. So now it's caught on around the area, and people look at the one with the kid reading the book. <laughs> <laughs> people are putting googly eyes on historic I be statues all so over. Much, but I think this is hysterical. So I think we should do this. Maybe we should. Maybe we should. Although I think we're late to the game. Everybody seems to be doing it. Look at the woman looking at that guy. That's what I love. Look at her looking at it like, oh, my goodness. Is that Melania? And the, look, the eyes are just so, because of, of the googly eyes, they're really white, the, and then they're little black dots. I think that's, I so love They're it. saying this is this has gone viral, and other cities are seeing similar googly eye crimes. <laughs> that's what caught my it's eye. It's such a 2018 crime, right? Googly eyes. Oh, my God. So that's what caught your eye? Yep. So how about you? Well, mine's visual as well, but I will walk our audio listeners through. So I came across, BuzzFeed is a destination for anything unusual. So you want you want some unusual facts that are often fun. Go to BuzzFeed, right? You like BuzzFeed. I do. Um, and so this is unbelievably gross facts that you'll wish you never read. Um, and it's all about germs and things like that. As we approach cold and flu season, a gentle reminder from our your friends of the focus group, wash your hands regularly. Are you a germaphobe? Not really. No, but every time I get sick, I backtrack and I try to remember when was the last time I didn't wash my hands and maybe touch a piece of food. I mean, I, you could scale, you could get through the winter pretty well if you just wash your hands, use soap and water, and clean them thoroughly. So if you get a cold or something, you start backtracking in your mind where you I, might have picked it I up. I want to know who to blame for that cold. <laughs> There's a lot of wasted space going on up there. A lot of what do you think about all that? A lot of bandwidth, right, Garrett? A lot of bandwidth <laughs> being misused for things. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. when I get sick, I want to blame someone. I can't just blame the universe. I want to blame that person on the train that coughed in my direction. You know. All right. A piece of the First up, 91% uh, of people pick their noses. I think we all knew that. But here's the first Whoa, 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 whoa. What? 91% of people pick their nose. 91. Pick yeah. their nose. Pick their nose. That's, that's the subhead. Okay. But here, let's go to our first slide. Demodex is a mite, a little microscopic mite that lives on our faces. They have no anus, and when they die, and they're microscopic, they release a lifetime of poop on your face when they go away. Though they vary in quantity by individual, studies show that the DNA from these mites is present on the majority of faces. So we have these little things that live on our skin, and they don't have an anus, and when they die, all their excrement just lands. they know they don't have an anus if they can't see them? I studied them. They have, you ever hear of a microscope? <laughs> Does a worm have an anus? <laughs> yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah. 
All right, so that's the first, Demodex. So our, all this stuff's on our skin all the time. The next one is, studies show that, this is one of my favorites, that most U.S. currency, most U.S. bills, have hundreds of species of microorganisms on them, and around 80% of the bills have traces of cocaine. <laughs> I always heard that about the hundreds. They Did you the really? On them. I, I'll tell you this. If I go to a store and somebody's skeevy in front of me, and I know they've handed a bunch of singles and they want to give them back to me, I sometimes skeeve out. I will separate those bills. You will. You, <laughs> gets a little lice. So. so in a 2017 study, researchers swabbed bills in New York City and found a variety of micro, microorganisms, including bacteria from the mouth, vagina, and skin. The vagina? I'm just... Well, some people put their money I'm there. just reporting the facts. Yeah. And, of course, cocaine. <laughs> Next one up, 72% of shopping carts contain fecal bacteria, and 50% of shopping carts contain E. coli. So now when you go to the grocery store, you know what you got to do, right? Sometimes they have those little sanitary wipes. Well, they you started that at wipe the, the handle. Auto. Wipe the handle off. I don't do that. Do you do it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I, never, I was one of those people who never did it. I'd laugh when I saw someone doing it. And then one year I thought, wait a minute. I got a cold. I, I got a cold. It might have come from the Hannaford shopping cart. See, see, my, see, Tim, you're on board with my logic oh. there. I, you're, you're getting it. Only one third of restaurant workers wash their hands when they're supposed to. And that's an interesting statistic because almost 60% of restaurants uh, in the U.S., handle food with their bare hands so you know it was a gross picture you picked by the way did that come with buzzfeed or did you pick that yourself? came with buzzfeed yeah. yeah i thought that was kind of a nasty fish are they, are they deboning a fish or something or yeah, it's not or sushi something? Oh, it's doing something here's one for all the uh here's one for my nieces to pay attention to a study of popular cosmetic retailers found staphylococcus which is a bacteria on 40 percent of makeup testers and mold <laughs> on 28 percent of testers the study pulled samples from eyeshadow mascara lip gloss lipstick and blush at sephora the body shop mac and shoppers drug mart so you know how those people are oh let's do makeup yeah Indeed. Staphylococcus Stephanopoulos' cousin. <laughs> that's the, bad, that's the, the cousins well, they don't like to talk to, right? Well, I often wondered about that when I see people in the, at the higher-end department stores yeah. where they're getting makeup done, and, and they just take a alcohol, and I guess they kind of wipe the lipstick or something. Mm, that's the high-end store, right? But, yeah. but I guess it's a four. You don't, get the, you don't get it wiped out. And last but not least, if you're watching this or listening, if you're watching or listening on your phone, guess what? Uh, the cell phone you're holding carries 10 times more bacteria than a toilet seat. <laughs> Keeping your Everyone's phone... phone? Everyone, keeping your phone out of the bathroom helps prevent some of those germs. So most I never understand why people are on the toilet talking anyway when you're in a public restroom. Everybody take. I purposely start flushing, making noise. So that then someone, you hear I'm in the bathroom. <laughs> someone has to say where they are. Okay. You so, know what's worse is the and I surprised it was was the remote at a hotel room. A remote, a remote at a hotel room. One of the dirtiest uh, places in the city of New York are the door handles on Tiffany's. That's a famous old. I thought it was urban legend, but it's actually true. Because uh, everybody touches the doorknobs. Um, yeah. So that's a germy world. And I just wanted, as winter... This thing's probably filthy. This is Mike. <laughs> I don't, we, actually, that's something when we used to be... you get traveling through here. Is there anything... I just wiped it before your show. Good. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's devotion they to the to focus smell. group. I used to serious. They yeah. Used to stink. Yeah. I, well, I'll let a little fact. Tim used to sit... In the OutQ studio, you used to sit far away from the door because you could see everybody yeah, I coming, see who's coming in. I sat at the mic that was nearest the door, and that was also where Derek sat and where Mike Signorelli sat. And one day Harry, I come in, and, and the mic had Frank. this terrible smell to it. Like, not terrible, but it, yeah, it was it's bad. It's a terrible smell. And, uh, and Katie goes, oh, you got Mike's coffee breath. Have a good day. <laughs> I used to wipe those things down with Lysol before you came in every day. Remember the, the wipes you had? Yeah. That was nasty. So that's what caught my eye. Nasty, nasty. There you go. We had googly eyes and germs. Germs. This is why... Dirty money, googly eyes. Dirty money. And yeah. a Crafts Food Business birthday. Mm -hmm. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. This was an odd business birthday today, but I wanted to do it. But it, it, I have no date of death. Only have date of birth. It came through the Canadian uh, genealogy site. So sometimes I have trouble finding birthdays. I don't even know how you find any of this stuff to begin with. So this is October 17th. He was born October 17th, 1880. Charles Kraft. 
and uh, he was one of the five Kraft brothers, or four brothers, that started Kraft Foods. So we all know the famous Kraft Foods. But they were Canadians. They were born in Stevensville, Ontario, near Fort Erie. Are you serious you don't have a date of death? No, and I've looked everywhere. And It's so the first time you've ever done this. So if you're listening, there's a slide that says Charles Kraft, October 17, 1882. Two. Nobody maybe, knows. Maybe he was frozen like Walt Disney. Well, and then they have it. So Kraft Foods has a history genealogy site or whatever, but they don't have, they, they've kind of glossed over. So all the, the four brothers that started Kraft, they were um, Charles Herbert, who we're celebrating today, James Lewis, Frederick, Norman, and John Henry. James Lewis, or known as J.L. Kraft, became, they made him the CEO. So he's the one who has all the press. Mm. The other three, or the other four, didn't necessarily get the press. But the brother there that we're talking about, Charles Kraft, got that wagon there that you see. And I thought it was funny. The wagon, you, you, you want to take a guess what the horse's name that pulled the wagon was? Oh, my God. Is it guessable? Yeah. Is it some product? They, is it, Vel, is old, it Velveeta? A paddy wagon. <laughs> <laughs> It's a paddy wagon. You guys know it back there. <laughs> Velveeta. Velveeta. Is it? How did it get paddy wagon? Gave the name paddy wagon. They started Kraft Foods with sixty-five dollars in capital. So the family left Canada. Of course, came came to the United States. Where were we? We've got to start one of these. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they rented the wagon and a horse named Patty, and uh, they bought cheese from local Chicago warehouses and then resold it. And then people caught on that they were reselling their cheese, and so they put them out of business. So they started their own, and they were the first to pasteurize cheese so that wouldn't spoil. So that was in 1914. They opened their first cheese factory in Illinois, and they began producing processed cheese. And the biggest uh, purchaser was the U.S. government for the military because <laughs> the cheese wouldn't spoil. Which Reagan gave away. <laughs> Did we have a warehouse? Show cheese. <laughs> there, yeah. So the... Um, so the family, the Kraft name there was K-R-A-F-F-T, and they were German. And because it was World War One, okay. they took the F, F off because they didn't want to be Americanized, they to Americanize the name, themselves. Right. So uh, and then, it, so in 1916, they did this cheese. Uh, they got the 1917 government contract. 1920, they entered the Canadian market and purchased something called McLaren's Imperial Cheese House. And then they hired a home economist, and they opened the Kraft Kitchen. And Which I think was one of the biggest innovations because that Kraft Kitchens is like my dad's favorite cheese, Velveeta. Mm -hmm. When do you think that came out? Oh, uh, um, I want to say that came out in was it the 30s? 1928. 28. Velveeta okay. cheese, Miracle Whip. We were a Hellman's family. We weren't Miracle Whip, but we were Miracle Hellman's Whip too. Yeah. salad dressing came out in 1933 at the World's Fair in Chicago. And I thought this was an invention of the 70s, but Kraft Macaroni and Cheese Dinner debuted in 1937. Really? It was introduced with the slogan, make a meal, and f make a meal for four and nine minutes. So Kraft Macaroni and Cheese, which you could still buy in the 80s. We bought it in college, remember, 23 remember, cents a box. Do you remember the jingle? No. Yes, yeah, sure you do. So please make some Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. John remembers. He was just nodding his head. Yeah, there was a jingle. Was there? Did you yeah. make it in college? Oh, my God. Well, yeah, there were weeks when macaroni and cheese was what you had every night because that, well, that's what you could buy for three bucks. You get a bunch of boxes, right? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, but I, I didn't know that there was a jingle. They tried to develop land in Florida. That went bust. <laughs> and <laughs> Later uh, on, it was called Disney World. No. <laughs> but the Kraft Family Farm is still located, for our Canadian listeners, at Bowen and Winger Road in Stevensville, Ontario. You can go there. It's still a working farm the Kraft family farm in Ontario. But so the business birthday, so I looked everywhere. And as he became an American, I guess, um, they really don't acknowledge well, why Charles you... Kraft, but they acknowledge just J.L. But they haven't born October 17th, 1880, but they don't have a, d All a right, date so, of death. All right, so take a g guess at the date of death. Then. I'm going to guess 50s. Uh, all right, so seventy something. Maybe he lived to seventy. Yes, and I tried finding it. I couldn't. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find any of the brothers, and then I lost interest. <laughs> <laughs> and then I lost interest. But um, bum. So that was the business birthday. But I, I like the idea of Kraft Foods. Hey, look who's here. Madonna. No, Madonna. We used to always put that on the board in series. So, as many of you know, Deep Discount is a friend and partner of ours here on the Focus Group. And guess who's making a return visit? Arr, it's the fo it's the deep discount shark. See, I'm, be I'm better at the puppeteering now. Are you? Did Talk. you practice? Well, I like the close-up camera. We need now. to give the shark a name. 
This month's sale is boxed sets. <laughs> sets. Can we give the shark a name? Maybe we should have a contest. I don't name know. The shark. All right. So if somebody names him, we have some extra discs from Criterion yeah. we can give away. So I, I don't think it's a problem. And as as Sharky was saying, thank you, Rehoboth. This is one of the best purchases from Rehoboth Beach. The seashell shop. The shark puppet. Where we didn't do well at Minutes no, of Wealth. No, you and I didn't. Bob did great. So it's the box set sale, folks. And this is a great sale. We love this one. Um, there, And look what John does now. He has a shark flying through. Arr, the shark for deep discount. All right, so a box sets is a really big sale. In fact, this was multi, multi pages deep. And I did your little game of going as so far. I, I went far in. I went like 25 pages in, as a matter of fact. But what did you pick? So there was lots to choose from, as you and, said, and so I decided I was going to pick something that you can't get anywhere else. So sometimes you can find things on television or you can find them on cable. I haven't seen this anywhere. Maybe they do run it. I've just never seen it. The Ultimate Little Rascals Collection. So remember our gang? Oh, yeah. Little Rascals. I grew up watching this stuff. They, right, so and they, were, they were old by the time we were watching it, know, right? So they released this from, uh, was it from the Legend Film Studio. It's, uh, it was released in 2015. And the box set is $15.34, according to the site there. And uh, so you save quite a bit. And you can't really find these on YouTube or any of the other channels. Do you remember the name of the dog? Around. Petey. Petey. <laughs> An interesting thing about the dog, Petey, the ring was done by Max Factor. Remember the Seriously? cosmetic guy? He put the ring on the dog to make him interesting. Rumor has it Petey was poisoned. By the makeup? No, by some... <laughs> That's funny. That'd be funny. <laughs> Sorry, Max Factor. Yeah. So they had to get a new dog, and they said you can tell when the new dog started because they put the ring on the other side. Wow, interesting. Okay. That was one of the trivial facts. But this was a 20s, 30s, 40s, um, the, the very first, um, what they, I guess what they would call family fun, yeah. the shenanigans of little mm -hmm. kids. And uh, this is a great collection. There's 50 hilarious, they say, hilarious and heartwarming episodes. Each one has been restored and presented in its original black and white format. And then they did 27 of them in color. Colorized. I've never seen I, the colorized We've only before. watched black and white. That would That's be interesting I've watched to too. see. And my little brother and I used to always try to replicate things they did. We tried to make the fire engines once with the, the ladders mm -hmm. and everything. And it, as, as a little kid, I just always remember loving it. And that's because it was re-released in the 50s. Yeah. And that's where the little rascals came from. Up until the, thir to the late 30s and 40s, it was called Our Gang. And uh, a couple of funny trivia facts. Mickey Rooney and Shirley Temple, both auditioned, didn't make it. Interesting, because they became, you know, little rascals Obviously themselves very, right. in a different way, right? And then Ernie Sunshine Sammy Morrison was the first African-American actor ever to sign a long-term contract in Hollywood in 1919. And that's one of the... He was on the show, yeah. And then George Spanky McFarlane's final role was on Cheers. The, the uh, TV show Cheers, he, he died soon after, but he, he did a cameo there where he was sitting at the bar having a drink. And uh, it was in 1993. And I remember reading something that a lot of the, the kids in the show, they, they didn't have exactly great lives after. Is that my imagination? Well, that happens with a lot of... Um, the child actors. Yeah, because you... It happens with a lot. I think it still happens with child actors, right? Because you lose your childhood. Uh, and you peak super early. <laughs> and, then nobody, and then you get typecast and nobody wants you. I think, yeah. what is it? Ron Howard's the only one who seems to have done anything. And the other one that was on here, what was his name? Beretta. Why am I going to forget his name? The guy that was famous. You know, who, who was the famous little rascal? The guy supposedly killed his wife. You mean the one with the little the cowlick? Robert Blake. Robert Blake. Oh, 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 he. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's our <laughs> our peanut gallery's peanut gallery. chiming so in. That, so I picked the little rascals. All right. So I, I, I had a bunch of sets up on screen, and I'll say it just really quick. You never can go wrong with Six Feet Under. Alan Ball, love the show. You can't go wrong with Orphan Black, which is a sci-fi show that BBC ran a few years ago, five seasons. But I landed on a series that I've never watched, but I'm dying to watch when it came out. It's called Life on Mars. It's not what you think. It's where they grow the potatoes? <laughs> no, that's The Martian with Matt Damon from uh, Team America. Sam Tyler is a police detective in 2008 when he gets struck by a car and is knocked unconscious. When he comes to, he finds himself in 1973 and he goes to his old precinct and, precinct and is mistaken for a transfer from another precinct. He finds himself trying to do things a little differently from what he is used to and he tries to figure out why he is in 1973. So this is an American remake of a BBC show 
called Life on Mars. And by all accounts the of the reviews, the American remake is actually better than the original it was based on, which is very odd for American shows. How old is it? Um, well, it takes place in 73. Okay. This came out in 2008, 2009. It's 17 episodes, and it does have, since they knew they were being canceled, they, they do wrap the series up and they give you all the answers. So apparently, episode 17, the last one, is, is, a, is like, wow, it's an amazing episode. So I picked Life on Mars, because if you're going to buy a box set and it's going to be as inexpensive as it is on deep discount, why not pick something you haven't seen, and it's a different way of binge watching. Old school binge. Yeah, you just put the disc in, push the button, start playing. So it's not it's old school binge. <laughs> yeah, so what's the release this week? The release this week is Ant-Man and the Wasp on Blu-ray, and it's another one from the a, a uh, action-packed um, Marvel sequel. I, I, I don't uh, know much about it. Okay, did you, did so you watch it because you 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 tend to be more well, up on some of. For starters, this whole thing about the Ant Man is they develop a suit that he can control and he can go to the quantum level and he can miniaturize himself. Or I, I don't know they they use the phrase, but it's just the quantum level. I have you know I talked to you about this before about miniaturization, mm -hmm. which you don't like. You get I scared. I really really just stay away from like there was that movie with Matt Matt Damon downsizing. Which I refuse to see. Bob wanted to, to pick it up the other day. I'm like, no, 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 no. Why, do you, no, no. why are you scared of I do not know. I do not know. But is I just that, is that a phobia? It must be about loss of control or something. Somebody could step on you. <laughs> you went right for the biggest problem I would ever have. If, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, you know, kid, like, honey, I shrunk the kids. They make it playful. You know, here's a blade of grass. There's a grasshopper. Oh, no. And then, you know, like, I, I don't, I never liked those things. But... He's joined, and uh, Paul Rudd plays Ant-Man, and uh, Michael Douglas is in the movie, and Evangeline Lilly is the is the Wasp, and she's apparently going to help find Michael Douglas's wife, uh, Pym, who's trapped in the quantum world as a miniature oh. per, as a miniature thing, or I don't know, they don't call it miniaturization, they call it the quantum world. So anyway, right. it got great reviews. It's supposed to be a lot of fun, and th the miniaturization that I saw always had a good resolution. So I, I suppose like I could Jack sit, and the Beanstalk. I suppose I could sit through it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so everybody, head over to focusgroupradio.com. Click on the deep discount logo. Arr, saving away, it's shark. a boxed box set sale, and John recommended this week Life on Mars which was a complete series on DVD. I recommended The Ultimate Little Rascals, and the new release this week is Ant-Man and the Wasp on Blu-ray. So now we have to... Now we have to Let's set. see if you two coordinate this. Thanks, Deep Discount. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to practice. Before. Well, actually, what we should do is there should be a shark cam, like a smaller cam, maybe my phone or something, and then we should we should record it in advance. Uh, having I could sync it to. Thanks, Deep Discount. Yeah, thanks, there you go. Deep now you discount. got a discount. Discount. You got a discount. You're right. There's two like discount. <laughs> Arr, discount. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break. It'll be very quick. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the top 10 most stressed out states in America. Stay with us. Brought to you by the Volkswagen Tiguan. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. Try, really try. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. I never try anything. I just do it. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is where you need to go to find out all about the show. Our platform is both audio and video. So as Tim said at the uh, end of last segment before the break, uh, we're now going to talk about the 10 most stressed out states in the U.S. And this list is compiled by Career Services uh, site Zipia. Z-I-P-P-I-A. Now, I might have come up with something a little different than Zipia. Zipia. But someone paid for that name. Um, <laughs> and what they did is they looked at, to create the ranking of the most stressed out states, they basically looked at a bunch of factors, six in fact. Long, uh, long commute times, unemployment, hours worked, the population density of the state, home price to income ratio and the number of uninsured residents in each state by the way i love the the pictures you found when i went through the deck 
<laughs> stressed out. That poor little chihuahua. I love the kid with the cigarette in his mouth. I don't know where you found out. This alphabet shit is stressing me out. I just typed in stress. And you got uh, I got these Google images that popped up. So. <laughs> you kept it real simple. Just yeah. plug in stress. <laughs> So, was, so before you found, or be, when you told me you had found this article and we talked about it, and you said to me, can you guess what some of the states were? And I thought initially, before you went through the criteria, I thought, well, I wonder if it has to do with working or it has to do with whether you put food on the table every month and so I sa or every week. And I said, I would guess some southern states. And you said yes, but then you said there were also going to be some surprises. You, you guessed quite well um, because there are really only... Uh, four northern states and everything else is uh, there's some of the usual suspects. So let's start. Let's we, let's. Re I think we did it in reverse order on yeah, the okay. So number ten. What's the so first? number ten? The ten tenth most stressed out state in America is Mississippi. M i s s i s s i p p i. M i s s i s s i p p i. Don't used to be so kid. hard to spell. It used to make me cry. Why do we remember these little kids' rhymes and we're like so old? Um, so Mississippi is one of them, and... It says it's ranked high for unemployed residents, uninsured residents, and long work hours. I actually thought Mississippi was probably happy here, because that means they were 40th. <laughs> and they're usually... <laughs> Mississippi usually is 48th, 49th, and 50th in any measure, whether it's education or income or anything. So this is actually a pretty good thing for Mississippi. So how did you interpret the thing with Mississippi where they said it was dangerous commutes? What is a dangerous commute? In Mississippi? Yeah. It could have be going to the, the local store and, you know, not making it, you know, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was weird, too. I mean, I, I understood the, the other the criteria, the other criteria yeah. when they talked about uninsured, which would stress you out. And they talked about um, uh, unemploy, unemployment residents, work yeah. hours. But, yeah, I didn't know about the dangerous commute. They Unless they, the roads aren't good. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. All right, so what was number nine? Number nine was no surprise, I guess, Virginia. Why was that no surprise to you? Well, because I think there's a lot of government workers that work in Virginia. I think government's stressful work, don't you? <laughs> of course, I, I don't know what they're stressed about. I, they got I a pension. Do, I do think and that as well. the commutes are horrible. Yeah, that's, it's long, long. You're sitting in traffic the whole time. And outside of probably the the counties or the areas right around D.C., it's, it's still quite rural. And, and Like that is, sign? So uh, if you're listening, Tim put up a graphic, and there's a picture of a handmade sign along the side of a road in full, and it says, Moonshine Fur. F-E-R. Moonshine for sale. Call Bill Jones. And then there's a sign next to it that says, don't, says don't tell, tell police. Po police. P-O-H-L-I-C-E. <laughs> don't tell the police. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number eight is North Carolina. Yeah, North um, Carolina. I, I, um, this one surprised me only because I thought the same thing of... There is Charlotte, which is a pretty cosmopolitan place, but then is it the rural aspect of, again, uninsureds, unemployment, long Probably. work hours, yep. and so forth. And then number seven was Maryland. Which surprised me as well, but maybe that's because of its proximity to D.C. Well, I was going to say Maryland reminds you of the D.C. thing, right? So it's part of the whole the whole. Uh, area. <laughs> Love that graphic. We've got the good kind of crabs. <laughs> Maryland. Ah, there you go. Number six, no surprise, one Louisiana. of the welfare states. Louisiana. And uh, so, again, with, I think a lot of this is, <laughs> when we've done these lists before, there's an issue of, of work, but then there's the stress of work, of unemployment, education, health care. And uh, unfortunately, I think, I don't know if it's proximity of location, but there just seems to be these things pocket around mm. Louisiana, yeah. Mississippi, Arkansas, Alabama. My state of New York came in at number five. And um, as the article says, it may not surprise anyone that states like New York uh, would come in because of uh, high costs of living in long commutes. So that, that was a logical thing, right? I love some of the pictures you New York surprised me because... Well, New York is so... Uh, big. It's a big state. Right, but it's it's even different than California in that I think, you know, as cosmopolitan and as busy and big as New York City is, the other side of it could be as rural and country bumpkin as can be as well upstate. Oh, hey, you go 100 is, miles north of the city, yeah. You're, which is in California, even though you've got L.A. and San Francisco, San Diego, I'm not so sure the ruralness gets you as much as it would in New York State, mm. which is, I, th I think, why... 
why that one surprised me a, a tad. Well, and coming up uh, right behind New York is California, which is not surprising either. But we all know that for long commutes and the cost of real estate, cost of living. It, it's yeah, and and of course, if you're living on the, in the back behind you, there's a wildfire going on, right? I think you even did some of those. We pictures. had we had um, when I was in corporate America. If you got transferred to one of the offices in New York or California, there was a special. Uh, budget to help with the people with Relo because in order for them to have oh, both commutes are bad. Wow. If you were going to be outside the city, but in order to find a home that's not going to take you an hour and a half to get into to either L.A. or or San Francisco, there was some, some additional monies and help with Relo because it's so expensive. Yeah. Try, right to try to help you with housing. This next one really sort of surprised me actually, and for the reasons we'll list in a minute. Number three, Florida. Yeah, so they said in Florida, Zippia found that outside of the retired 65 and over population, many Floridians are without health insurance. In fact, the state ranked number three in the category of uninsured Americans. So it's three, it's ranked three as the most stressful to live in, but three as the most uninsured people. And then you have the hurricanes and yeah. the weather and, and global or climate change with my, Miami floods every once in a while still now, doesn't it? I have no, I, listen, do you like Florida? I, a lot of people I know want to retire to Florida. I have no desire to retire we're, to Florida. Our accountant tells us all the time, you guys ought to retire to Florida. We're like, really? I have two friends that just did it, just changed their residencies to Florida. But I don't have any, first of all, I'm scared of gators. And the one woman I know, she, you can't let your animal out at night you where you she lives yeah, because she's on a canal and the gators are eating them. And then she won't go out her front door because there's a snake living in the tree. I said, you know what? Why do you want to live there? And I want to be somewhere where it's cold enough where things die <laughs> so they can't get big. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that's northeast. But hey, look, a lot of friends say, oh, you got to relocate to the panhandle of where or to the western side of Florida. Oh, like, yeah. And then what did we have last week? One of the biggest hurricanes to make landfall in history, right, was right there on the panhandle. So I, I'm not sure Florida would rank up there on my list. It's not. What's number two? Number two was Georgia. Georgia on my mind. Um, You're not surprised by that either? I'm, you know, George, Atlanta probably has one of the worst commutes in the country. That's what they talked about. They and, talked about um, that, yeah. But it also has, again, outside of Atlanta, there's a high unemployment rate. There's a high number of uninsured uh, individuals. And sometimes I used to have sympathy for these uninsured states, but a lot of these people have governments that are, you know, they didn't want to take. Oh, there was a Republican governor that said, I'm not taking the expansion of Medicaid. We're not doing Obamacare. It's all on principle. And, yeah. and, and these, and they're, they're citizens. They're not doing their citizens any favors. No. But people keep voting them in. And the top state, the number one state, most stressed out state, if we were on the old platform, we were doing a Tim's list, this would be the uh, grand prize, New Jersey. And uh, New Jersey is no surprise because long commute times, expensive real estate. It's, it's this, almost some of the similar things with New York. Most right? densely populated state. state. Yeah. Poor New Jersey. It's border. You know, you got New York City on one side, Philly on the other. And a lot of us use Jersey to just get through. The corridor. It's a corridor. <laughs> it's a corridor. All right. So that's like the. like stopping in Chicago for gas. Just to recap, that. going 10 to 1, Mississippi, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, Louisiana, New York, California, Florida, Georgia, and New Jersey are the 10 most stressed out states. So here's what I'm going to do to you, John. So I'm going to take New York out since you live there. Okay. So if I had to tell you you had to go to move to one of these other nine states, which one would you go to? If I had to move? Yeah, I'm I mean, you I have, have to move. have to move. Hmm. I'm going to choose Virginia. Really? See, I would have never picked that for you. Eh, it's close enough to, you know, there's train access. I can get in a car, go somewhere. Virginia? Yeah, maybe. Or Maryland. Maybe Maryland or Virginia. My oh, sister lives in Maryland now. I'm shocked so. at that. What would you choose? California. Yeah. I wonder why I never lived in California. Of course, you know, I loved living out west. Yeah, well, I, I, would, I would have picked California, too, but it is... Too far away for you? Well, once you move, you move. I mean, you're you're out there. It's like you know, it's not bad getting out there. Maybe but if you day. maybe if you said you know if you chose a city like if you said it has to be Palm Springs, that'd be oh I'll, I'll go to Palm Springs. Well, Palm Springs or Herndon. <laughs> I'll take Palm Springs. Okay, Palm you're right. Palm Springs or Baltimore. Palm Springs. Okay. All right. I'm going to can I change my answer? I'm going to California. All right. <laughs> so we'll post that on our Facebook page. So if uh, you want to follow along and check out the 10 most stressed states in America, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about a flight that you should consider taking if you're a Brit, I guess, or if you're European. Or if you're 
in London and you have to get to the US. You have US. to get home, that's a good one. And we're also gonna try two new flavors of Oreo cookies. So stay with us. Brought to you by the seven-seater Volkswagen Atlas. Life's as big as you make it. Visit VW.com to learn more. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money than I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Roche. He is doing well. Welcome back to the Focus Group. John Nash with Tim Bennett. Focusgroupradio.com is all you need to know and all the places you have to visit to find out where we are. So you're writing stuff down. We're yeah. doing This is taste testing. All right, so as Tim said before the break, uh, we do have another shop talk. It's a quick one. And uh, Virgin Atlantic is launching a pride flight with LGBTQ crew. So Titus Burgess, who uh, you might know from... The unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, he's also a Broadway uh, star, is going to be the in-flight host, I suppose, of this London, once one flight, it's London to New York, and it's going to be happening in 2019 in honor of World Pride. And when it takes flight, you'll be able to play drag bingo. <laughs> There'll be live performances on the plane. I mean, some people may not want to take that flight, but I think it'd be pretty hilarious. So, um... This is Virgin's efforts at, uh, you know, celebrating the 50th Stonewall, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Now, that's going to be a huge event here in New York. Mm -hmm. Are you big, big partaking thing. in anything? Well, I we'll be, if we should do anything. We'll be here. I think we should, actually. So I was, I was reading everything they had. So you said they're doing drag bingo. They're also going to have an onboard DJ, yep. a Judy Garland sing-along, I'd rather slip my wrist, and inner seat speed dating and live performances. Now, I will say I hate the flight first world problems. I hate the flight from Europe to the States. It takes too long. It's long. It should go faster yeah. than well, eight hours. it's the jet stream the whole day. Yeah, right? so I could see where some of this might break up some of the fun, but it uh, might be a little bit over the top. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a fun thing, and so they're, they're priced as follows. Uh, uh, one way, I believe it's, is it says here, uh, return dates are flexible. Economy tickets start at 380 pounds, which I think with the pound of the dollar, we're talking about times almost two. 500. Oh, five or 600? That's what I'm guessing. You're just, you're just times two. Is I think it's pound like two bucks? 1.5. I think it's a dollar, dollar 150 to, the, to one or something. And uh, you could also do a three night room and flight package for 699 pounds, which I think if Tim's math is right, that would be 1200 bucks. So let's just, yeah, we'll just double it. It's easier, right? Well, they have a, th is that the three night room package? Yeah. I like that one. That, that's actually a good deal. Yes, it is, because it's flight and how room. Is hotels hotel? now, I right? wonder what hotel they're picking in New York. <laughs> oh, might be down that's... at the, the, Newark, the Newark Ramada Inn. <laughs> have to get the that trip. qualifies as New York. So, um, hey, guys, I think I included in the deck a MP4. John's nodding his head, yes. Yeah. So here's the ad they're running to promote this uh, thing. The Virgin Pride Flight. So that it was the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> and then you thought to yourself, no, it's Kabuki Theater. It's a bunch of drag queens. Oh, you don't want to miss his flight. <laughs> Come get fabulous at 30,000 feet. <laughs> you don't want to miss this. Flight. Oh, you don't want to miss this flight, the Pride flight. So that's Virgin Atlantic. You go to virginatlantic.com to check that out. I think, it's, again, a, I think it's a smart idea. It's uh, And, and they're... Uh, their chief executive, what was the executive vice president, says, we're not the type of company to mark an occasion like this half-heartedly. We're going to be pulling out all the stops. And that's what they did. So um, kudos to Virgin. And if you take that flight, we may want to have a, we want to be, should we embed a reporter? Well, I was, well, that's good, maybe we should take the flight. Maybe we should contact Virgin and tell them we'll do the flight. We'll do the show from it, from the air. Of course, I want a business class. So John's nodding his head yes. Garrett's kind of undecided. Garrett's like me. Garrett, do you want to go? You're not so sure. Yeah. Would you dress really? in drag? Go. Definitely not. You wouldn't do drag? I bet, well, John, would you do drag? For a free first class ticket, like one of those like pod things? Yeah. Yeah, I would do it. Yeah, he'd do drag. You're going to put him in a pod. Dude, where are you we gotta going, sit by the way? The whole flight, cool? you got to be in drag? 
Almost. Well, you know, maybe it's just a, a blonde china cut wig or something. Like I something. mean, I'll do that. But Come on. You look good in a little china wig. Yeah. Little china. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I was voted that most likely in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it with you. We'll, we'll, we'll do like a, a burka. All right, cool. A moo moo. A moo moo. Yeah. I'll leopard, do that. I'll do leopard. You'll do zebra or something. And we'll, we'll, you and I will sit up in the and front. And John has to keep his facial hair. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of what color the wig is, whatever, that's... That's, you know, that's a good idea, John. We should try to contact Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Holidays and see if we can, uh, can do this. But it's also with the New York and Company, and they've been on the show before. Yes. So the Chris Fredericks, I think, is... Mm -hmm. Looks like contact. we could do something there. Let's see what's up. That's My guess idea. is there's a number of, uh, of people that are trying to uh, to do this. Now, there was one little controversy surrounding this, though. Did you read that last paragraph? Yeah. It said, last month, female drag act Lacey Liu, real name Lacey McFadden, so it's a real woman, claimed she was dropped from the Virgin Atlantic ad for the Pride flight because she's a woman. A spokesperson for Virgin Atlantic insisted that McFadden was not rejected because of her gender, but that the final choices were based on aesthetics, ethnicity, height, and performance. Now, when you saw the TV ad, if yeah. it's aesthetics, maybe she wasn't doing full kabuki, you know, where she had all that makeup and stuff. Everyone's on. got a problem with everything, right? There's, there's no, always we always say, wrong, There's yeah. always someone's got a problem. All right, taste test time. So we mentioned um, there's two new, I was in the store and I saw, <coughs> excuse me, two new flavors. Love what the, the, your cup is doing with the, uh... What's the cup so John, John purposely gave us green cups so that you can't, <laughs> for our milk. Oh my gosh, See, look it's like the Invisible Man. I love that. Green, I was going to wear a green sweater. Glad you didn't. It. Glad you yeah. didn't. All right, so you have two new, we're not sure. We think we sampled one flavor before. We thought we sampled one before. So one's limited edition. It's apple pie. So everybody's got a, everyone's got a cookie if you want to taste, taste one here in the studio. Oh, you didn't get yours yet? No. <laughs> the thing most, Wait, that's you have to do that. That's the but that so one ooh, of the boy. things that everybody's mentioning is how fragrant fragrant they are, and everybody likes the way they they smell. And uh, some of the other people I've talked about, they said the smell of cinnamon and graham foremost um, is what people liked about these. They also said they have hints of tart apple layered in the background. Now Garrett is our official oreographer. He maps out the Oreos. You're an Oreologist, Tim. He let you have that title a while ago. So it's a little pop tarty. Here's the question: With milk, I think this is fantastic. I actually like it. What do you think, Garrett? I do like it. Not much apple flavor, as much as cinnamon, blah blah blah, which is good. But I wish there was a little more apple flavor. Yeah, I agree. Great. It's yeah. more like having the crust and not the apple. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. It's like the crust of the pie. So the review of this was is that. Um, they think it's one of the most accurate creams in recent memory. So the cream inside of the apple. Oh, okay. They said you could taste the cinnamon dusted apple first with a dash of nutmeg trailing behind. Some people think the apple flavor could be a little more pronounced. Out, yeah. Which is what Garrett said. But uh, overall, people like it. It's one of the favorite cookies. There was one complaint. Somebody said it tasted like they were eating an apple candle. No, I don't get that at all. Yeah, I, I don't get the fake. I definitely get crust, flavor. but I don't get apple candy. And I will say this was a good one for me too. Now, I, I think it's, um, I think they did do, do a good job with this one. It doesn't taste as fake as, no. as maybe some of them do. This is a limited edition cookie, and uh, get them while they're hot. Limited edition. The other one, which is also graham, uh, graham cookie flavored or graham cracker flavored, is the chocolate peanut butter pie, Oreos. And so we'll sample these. These actually are not limited edition. They're going to be a part of the regular. This is part of the regular rotation. And uh, they said. Oh, this has an interesting flavor when you. They said there's nothing new here, butter. though. Nothing new? Because they've done peanut butter Oreos and they've done chocolate Oreos. So all they did is they, they took the two and just made a combination. So they said there's nothing really here to report um, other than they put it on the Graham Cookie Wafer. Hmm. And they said, these are not limited edition. They're going to be part of the regular lineup. What I thought about both of these, as you said, John, they're good with milk. But they'd also, thank God Garrett's guys on the milk train. They taste great with milk. Well, they'd yeah. be, they would be great, I think, if you wanted to do yourself a comfort food dessert. So if you had people over for dinner, you did a scoop of vanilla ice cream, and you put one of these cookies on top. Don't you think right. it'd be good? Who, who, gets stuck yeah. buying, or, who gets stuck buying Girl Scout cookies? I thought everybody in the world does. I mean, yeah. they're always around. So these taste a lot like those, 
what are they, uh, Samoas or something? No, they're the like Samoas are coconut. The Tandies? Uh, yeah, Sandies. Are they are they peanut butter Sandies no, or something? It's Tandies or something. It's called Tandies. But they taste like a Girl Scout cookie to me. A peanut butter Girl Scout cookie. They do. I, I don't get a lot of chocolate. If I had to do, I'm going to do another one here. <laughs> so what's your favorite? Uh, of the two of these? Yeah. I have to say the apple pie, um, only because it's different. And I have, I'm not sure that the, that, that, that peanut butter chocolate thing could have just been a peanut butter cookie. Well, that's what they said. There's nothing new here. But it, I think they did a good job with it. Guys, yeah, I really think? like that. that I like the favorite. peanut butter one better. Do yeah. you really? Yeah. Yeah, very good. That was really good. You mm -hmm. both like the peanut butter peanut butter um, pie chocolate. one better? Pe yeah. uh, chocolate peanut butter pie? I will say, this is a first for me. Usually when we try these, I'm kind of eh. I, I like both of them. I would eat both of them. Yeah, I like both of them, but if I had to pick one. Because my favorite yeah. of the season so far has been, you want to guess? Mm. We tried this year. Oh, the... Um, Begins with a P. The pistachio. Pistachio. Oh, pistachio the thin. thins. Oh, yeah. Pistachio is my favorite this year. Yeah. And I okay. see those still in the store and I want to You know, them. I bought the pistachio thins, and as I was having some, I was reminded of something that Garrett said about those. They have half the cream. So it's a different kind of a cookie, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. the, it's, it's more cookie than it is, I don't know. It wasn't your traditional Oreo. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Is anybody buying traditional Oreos anymore? Garrett does. Or he buys birthday cake. Birthday cake or yeah. golden. Yeah. Yeah. There's a new birthday cake cookie. Did you see it? No. It's with the chocolate, though. Oh, yeah. I've seen chocolate and golden Did birthday you like, cakes. Did you like it? No. I like them. I like golden better, but I like them both. All right. No, thank you, Tim, for a taste test. I'm. Hey, look. At the end of the day, you put any of these in front of me. If this bag is in my kitchen... It, they'll, a rat's going to be nibbling away at it all week long. It'll be gone. So, yeah, they'll get eaten, but it's a question of what I buy these. I still like the red velvet flavor, the red velvet cake. Yeah. yeah. That, one's be, that one's I see in the store a lot. I like this apple. <laughs> I do, I'm too. Surprised. I do, too. I think, that, I think I'd get some with some vanilla ice cream. I have people over for dinner. Mark and Carl are coming by, so I'll have to, I have to come up with a dessert. So that might be an easy dessert. You should do what they. Cheap? You should do what they did to us when they served the cookies with the dusting of sugar on it, and it came from Tim, where? And they made them. And it came from what the fresh, fresh market. Fields. Yeah, fresh market. And Tim, we're at this beautiful dinner, and they're serving dessert, and there's bottle empty bottles and with all this wine, and then Mark brings out because Bob had, couldn't have dessert because he's lactose intolerant or something, and Mark goes, "We made these cookies," and Tim just looks and cocks make his these. head, and there was like a there was like a powdered sugar on them, but that's the only thing he added. He threw some on, and he pulled plate. back saran wrap as if they had been freshly made. Like there was all the deceit was quite well done. But he was going at it for a while until he finally broke. <laughs> I broke him. I'm like, there's no and way we you all made laughed. these. And then yeah. he's like, No, you're right. We didn't make them. I was like, and we well, all, there you go. And we laughed and laughed. That was a very fun dinner. We had a great time at their place. So uh, that's it for this week. And uh, we, we, so, we, hey, listen, we were, John and I were talking early before the show. Aunt Barbara will be coming up in November, so uh, stay tuned for that. And uh, she'll be coming here to pay us a visit. Thank you, John. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Nash. Thanks to our friends at Deep Discount. Be sure to go to focusgroupradio.com. Click on the Deep Discount logo. Arrgh! away. We've got, uh, it's a box set sale this week. John recommended Life on Mars. Which is not what you think it is. Well... It's, it's sci-fi, isn't it's it? It's detective. It's a cop show. Isn't it sci-fi? It has a science fiction angle to it, yes. You don't like miniaturization, travel. but you believe in all this other stuff. <laughs> you know, I am a and the ultimate little conflicted rascals, mess, like, I know. right? I know you're conflicted. And the ultimate little rascals, right? The ultimate little rascals. And the, the release this week was... Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Ant-Man and the Wasp from Marv the Marvel series. Thanks to our friends at Volkswagen of America. Be sure to uh, check out all the great cars Volkswagen has. Go to VW.com and put Volkswagen on your shopping list. They actually, all the car companies, but particularly Volkswagen right now, some great lease programs because it's the end of the year. It's the people, best time to buy one. People want to get rid, yeah. of their, rid of their vehicles. Don't text and drive. Arrive alive and have a good week. And don't forget our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned, every Tuesday. If you go to focusgroupradio.com, you'll find out where all of our media properties are. Have a good week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.